Well, I want to welcome everyone to Live Channel Denmark. And tonight we have Enoch with us from uh, America, and he's going to share a very, um, what should I say, interesting testimony. He has been walking with the Lord for a few years, but uh, then he something happened, and he thought, oh, you know, he wants to quit everything. But uh, we are happy that the Lord, he doesn't, um, uh, what do you call it, he, he um, He's really holding us to, on to us. So uh, Enoch, he chose to uh, continue to walk his Christian life, and uh, even now, even more than before, I believe. So he has a good testimony. So the time is yours, uh, Enoch. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm really glad to be able that uh, to meet each of you guys and be able to share how the Lord is. Um, helped me and encouraged me throughout the uh, years. I I gave my heart to Christ my, when I was 16, and um, very soon afterwards I started doing um, evangelism because I was coming from a lot of darkness into his marvelous light. And when I started to, to learn things and I realized that sin is the reason for all of my pain misery and sorrow i wanted to get sin out of my life as soon as i could and um the more sin i got out of my life the better my life got which made me want to um be closer and closer to god and that, that was a, a great blessing um as i started to follow the lord i realized that i have less and less in common with the teenagers that were my age and who were um, who were interested in like the secular music, worldly television, and just um, everyone's always trying to uh, all they can think about is being in a relationship with boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever the case is. And I was really focused on my relationship with Jesus. And so I just had less and less in common with, with the, the teenagers that I was around. And, um, and I, the, the thing happened was um, at one point, I, it, it was like six months into my Christian experience, I uh, was having a conversation with my best friend. And he was sharing that he, um, he, didn't really want to be a Christian anymore. Um, things were were difficult, and um, he just found that he his his motive wasn't really uh, strong enough. He was motivated by fear, fear of punishment, fear of torment, fear of different things. Um, and I was trying to encourage him, like, no, that's like. You, you don't want to do right just for fear of being lost. You want to do right because you're thankful. Uh, like, we love God because he first loved us. And if we love him, we can keep, we're can we going to keep his commandments. That's a, the natural outgrowth of love is expressing it through obedience. And he was, uh, I could see that he was just getting discouraged. And he's like, you know, I... I'm gonna. I, things are more difficult at my home. I'm, I'm, um, the only one who's at my house trying to do things right and follow follow God. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna live life and not worry about things. And then, um, and then when when I am older or when there's some more convenient time then I'm going to be a Christian. And um, the, I, it, it reminded me of Acts 24, 24. And um, I was sharing with him, it was, it was really sad because in Acts 24, 24, Paul was going through a very similar situation. It said, and after certain days when Felix came, with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, 
Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. But the thing about Felix is he too wanted to be a Christian uh, when there is a convenient season. But this season, this time is never promised. This time never came. To my knowledge, Felix died a lost man. There's another man, um, Agrippa, who um, he said, Thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. And my heart was just like going out because I remember it so vividly. We were standing by the bike rack outside of the school. We, there was an awning over our head. We were by the parking lot on one side of the building on the other. And he's just telling me, um, I, I, I just, right now it's hard to be a Christian and I gotta, I, I can't do this. And um, I'm, I want to be a Christian, but I, I want to do it later. And I, uh, my heart was sad for him. And... Uh, as I was was going the next uh, few hours, I, I think it was after school, and I was in in a town called Grants Pass over in Oregon, um, in the United States, and I was in a, a parking lot, and I was just thinking, I'm like, Lord, this this being a Christian is really hard, and. I don't know if I want to be a Christian and I was just thinking of all the trials and the hardships that, and really I was thinking about the sacrifices that I've made how I lost my best friends I have less in common with other friends I stopped smoking weed um, stopped playing video games and um, stopped watching just worldly movies secular comedy and uh, and just stopped watching a lot of videos. I, I changed my diet um, that I could be healthier, and and I was just like going. And then um, I was going down the list of all my sacrifices, and as I was looking at them, I'm like, wow, there's so many things that are different. There's so many things that I that I do differently now, and I was just like. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't have the strength to continue. And um, and that day, I decided to quit being a Christian. And I'm like, all right, no more Christianity. Life is going to be so much easier. And I don't have to sacrifice anymore. And then um, once I decided in my mind that I was done and no more of this Christianity stuff, and then I was able to think, well, okay, so... Practically speaking, what's my next step? What is life going to be like now? What do I get to do? It's like, and I went down the list, and I'm like, oh, uh, I, I still don't really want to waste time watching television. That just, uh, I watch a lot of comedy, and that just brought more sorrow in my life, and that was just, that, that was pleasures for a season. But um, there's so much more meaning in life. There's so many things to do. I don't, I don't want to be. Um, wasting my time in front of the screen and then I was thinking well I still don't want to play video games because those video games were just this, the same thing a total waste of time and they did a lot more harm in my life than good and then I was thinking well I I still don't want to cuss I still don't want to be mean to people um, I, I want to use my words very calculated be um, very encouraging and helpful and that's that's like a better way of life and so I'm like well I don't want to change my language and then I was thinking well I don't want to change my diet either those uh, I, I thought of myself eating some things that I used to and I'm like Ugh. I, I'm not even interested now I know what they put in the food and how they how they grow these animals and um, the diseases that they have, and I was just like, wow, I, I don't really want to change my diet, and um, I thought of some of the friends I stopped hanging out with, I'm like, yeah, they're kind of wasting away their life smoking marijuana and making babies while they're so young, and I'm like, ah, I don't, I don't want to, 
I don't want to have children early or just spend most of my day smoking weed and getting high and stuff. I'm just like, huh. And I just went down everything that I that I counted as a loss. I began to realize I I I still want to do all those things. And as I realized I still want to do all those things, the realization hit me. I want to be a Christian. That's what I want to do. And and I, it's kind of like when in John chapter 6, when Jesus was uh, saying, unless you drink of my flesh and eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, then you have no part in me, no eternal life. The 70 disciples, they all left Christ. And as 66, 666 um, says, the verse, they no longer walked with him. And then Jesus turns over to uh, Peter and he says, Peter, will you now leave me too? And I love Peter's response. He says, Lord, where else would we go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. And it was like so true. And I realized that I want to be a Christian. I don't want to do those things. That I, uh, that this is my choice. And as a result, it was, it was once I had that realization it, I realized that th what I thought was a sacrifice was really a gain. It was a blessing. It was things that I wanted to do. I'm not doing these things because of, because like it's against my religion or because I have to or because I'm afraid of torment or because I'm afraid of this. I'm choosing to live a different way because I see there are truly a better way of life where I have the greatest peace, the greatest happiness, and love and joy that I didn't have when I was living a different lifestyle. Outside of Christ, when I was dead in trespasses and sin, yes, I was walking, yes, I was breathing, but I was dead. I was so miserable. I wanted to die. I promised myself that I would not live to be 18 years old. And, you know, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death in children under the age of 30. From 11 to 30, um, the statistics from the World Health Organization 2016 are alarming. And really, I was on my way just to be another statistic. An aimless life is a living death. And in Christ, I found purpose. I found meaning. I, I, as I started studying the Bible, I, I found a Savior that satisfies all of my needs. And since then, I've had time to reflect and to see, well, what was the difference? Why, why did my best friend quit and why did I continue? And I began to realize that it was his practice that he only studied the Bible when he was around me. And when it was time in his personal experience, when um, he was at home, he rather play video games, and he had opportunity to be able to study the Bible and come closer to the Lord, and to find questions, answers to the questions that he has personally. But he didn't take it. He would open the Bible and be like, "This is boring. I don't understand what I'm reading." And then he'd close it, and then he'd go play video games. And I remember that. I opened the Bible and I'm like, uh, I don't get what this is saying. And I'm like, thee, thou, art. And like something about me is when I was 16, I read a total of six books in my entire life. And probably about five of them were when I was in uh, juvenile detention for like children's show. And I, I didn't read. So opening the Bible and reading and learning, my vocabulary was so small. And what I did, I consulted a dictionary. Webster's 1828 Dictionary has an amazing dictionary because it uses King James uh, verses. It uses the Bible to define um, all the words throughout the English language. And it is so awesome because it will actually use verses to explain the, the words. So I just went to the dictionary and I began to learn what is this saying, and um, 
And it's true. Sometimes I'd go to church and I'd be sitting there, and as I'm I'm hearing them talk, I'm like, wow, this seems really important, but I have no idea what these guys are talking about. They're like speaking over my head. They're using all this language I'm not familiar with, and I'm just like, huh. So what I determined to do is I determined to sit there, not focus on what I don't understand, but focus on what I am getting. So if I understood 3% of what was being talked about during the, the class at, at church, then I would be grateful for that 3%, and I would use that, and I would learn it. And then next time, I might learn, understand 10%. But I'm not focusing on the 90% that's going through one ear and out the other and rattling my brain. I'm, I'm focusing on the portion that I understood. And I'm glad because at the more that we learn, the more we're able to learn. And so... I, I was just, I was learning for a different purpose. Uh, John 7.17 7 says, If any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether I speak of God or whether I speak of myself. So one of a key principles for studying and understanding the express will of God that is written in his word, in order for us to understand his will, we need to be willing in our own life to apply it to our life. And I was willing. Oh boy, was I willing. I was fed up. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's only so many bottom of the bowls that you can get. And when you are realizing there's got to be more to life. I mean, I was hanging out with friends that they, they, they thought the ideal life would be to be able to smoke yourself until your brain is permanently fried. They called it a perma-high. And they would smoke bowl after bowl after bowl after bowl of marijuana. And they were trying to fry their brain so that they don't have to think about the, the pain and the sorrow and the, and the issues in life. And so that was their source of, that was their solution. That was their savior. But it didn't save them. They were miserable. And so I realized, I'm like, I don't want to go back to that. And outside of Christ, what else is there? Like, honestly, many of us, uh, it's like Psalms 119, uh, 172. It says, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. Why? That I might learn thy statutes. Many of us would have never came to Christ if it was not for um, a affliction that led us to the foot of the cross and that's so true I got to a point where I just fell on the rock and I was broken and because I was broken I just saw that my way is not working and I had to try something different when you get to a point where you're finally just realizing like I'm tired I'm so tired of doing my own thing taking advice from ungodly people, walking in the way of the sinners, standing in the way of the scorners, and surrounding yourself with people that are just have no fear of God in their life. And you realize that I, I'm like in this bucket of, of crabs trying to crawl out. And as you're trying to crawl out of this bucket, you have other crabs that are pulling you down. And they are also trying to crawl out. So it's just like when you're around worldly friends that have no interest in God, it's like they're trying to pull you down out of this bucket as you're trying to uh, find victory and freedom. We, gotta, we, we need a Savior to be able to pull us out of this pit. I, I like the verse in um, Isaiah 59 verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear nor his arms shortened that he cannot save and it's just it's amazing that we serve a god who is not represented as having like short and stubby arms that you know, when we're in this pit we're stuck in the miry clay in this horrible pit god is able to reach out and he's able to pull us out no matter what depths that we are in he's there for us and i'm like how amazing is that but my friend, while he was neglecting the personal study of the Word of God, meanwhile, every waking moment, I would, uh, even though I wasn't a reader, 
I would devour the Word of God, and I'm constantly trying to find questions in my answers. And um, whereas there were some people in my life that that I respected spiritually, but I didn't take their their word for the truth. I I went to the Bible, and I want to know well, what does the Bible say? Because this is this is the source of my my newfound joy, my newfound happiness. And I would listen to people what they said, but I, I would hear them. But I would do like a trust but verify. It's like I hear what you're saying, I trust you, but I'm just gonna verify w what it says. And so I'd go back and I'd study for myself. Well, my friend, he kind of like had a secondhand experience where he believed things because someone told him to believe it. And he may have studied the Bible when he was around like me or his or his dad or or someone else but he didn't really he didn't really um check the facts um on his own personal time so naturally it was um it wasn't his personal conviction um and, and another thing that i realized is that this motivation of fear is so dangerous because god doesn't want us to serve him because we are so uh, because we are we are afraid of torment and with some people like Jude says saving them with fear um, like pulling them out of the fire it's like there sometimes like fear might like get people at first to like make a reform or like do something different and they're like oh no I don't want to burn and but it's I, I see it's not something that's gonna last we can't just we can't just uh, fear people into obedience. Um, we have to learn to behold the love of God, because Romans chapter two verse four says, "It is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance." And if we're not being drawn, as Jeremiah thirty one three says, "I have loved thee with an everlasting love; therefore, with loving kindness I draw thee." If we're not being drawn because of this loving kindness, then we are not going to have that effect. We're not going to have that power that's enough to overcome sin. It's like another example. When I was younger, I, like from age 11 to 16, I was severely depressed. Also, age 11 to 16, I was playing a lot of video games. There's probably a connection. Um, and I was selfish. I was mean. I didn't have friends. I was mean to my sister, mean to my mother, who just relentlessly loved me and relentlessly was patient. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry for what I put her through. But um, I, uh, I, I didn't want to be mean, and I didn't want like I, I was pushing away the very people I wanted to bring closer. I was like making it difficult for people to love me. My aunt said I was pure evil and called me the devil child and um, she's just like why is he so evil I don't understand and the family was upset with me and and for good reason so so naturally I'm thinking to myself well I want to change I want to do something different and what I ended up doing was I I try to change and um, so that people could see a difference or they can notice that there is a change and um, I try to be nicer I try to participate more with the chores I try to um, listen better or do things that are kind to uh, the members of my family and um, but it was hard and sometimes I would slip up and then like my sister would be or or some family members would be they'd be like oh you're always the same. You never change. You're just the same, Enoch. You're doing. You're the same, same, same. And I'd hear that, and it would be like desolating hail. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. I am the same, Enoch. You're right. I am mean. I, I'm no different. And I, I would just lose my motivation for reform. And I'd go back to the old ways, the old me. And it was so hard. It was. It's a vicious cycle. Just doing the things that I don't want to do, trying to change, not having the strength to keep it, people don't realize that I fall back doing the same things I don't want to do. And um, 
I didn't know what to do. And I could tell you, it wasn't until I, um, until I gave my heart to Christ and my motivation for reform was the cross, not because I wanted other people to see that there is a difference, but because I am so thankful for what God has done for me in sending me his son to die for me that I want to give back to God what just a sliver of what he has given me. And with that motivation, I decided that I'm going to change because God wants me to change. I'm going to live happier. I'm going to live nicer, more obedient to my mother, more uh, kind to those around us. Um, because, uh, because God wants me to. Not because I have to. Not because um, I'm afraid. But because I love him. And I really want to please him. And, and I decided, I'm like, what if my family doesn't notice? And I just came to the conclusion, so what? If my family doesn't notice, they're going to miss out on and something amazing. I'm going to serve God with or without them. And I'm going to serve God because he wants me to and he's worth it. And so with that, I, I decided to change. And, and no longer was it changing from my own strength. It was like a divine strength came upon me to give me the the ability to <clears throat> to shift and I came home and it was like a 180 degree turn the opposite direction and instantly my mom could realize that day she had a new son I was I was more kind and more respectful more obedient more participating from that day forward and my relationship with my mom now she's actually in here in this uh, web room and We've been able to work in full-time ministry together for like the last, I don't know, like uh, probably about three years. Um, sometimes we're in different states, but the ministry is able to provide for her and be able to um, keep uh, keep working on different projects together. And uh, my relationship with my sister started to improve greatly. And my aunt came around within one week. This is a different aunt. She saw me, and she's like, Enoch, you're glowing. Like, what? what is different? Like, you're a different person. And I told her, I found Christ. I found the Lord. And he has satisfied all of my needs. And then the other family member, I mean, the other uh, aunt that said, like, I was pure evil, and I was, like, the devil child, I was, I was sitting at home one day, and I heard her talking to my mom, and she's like, Deborah, you don't realize, but Enoch doesn't know this, but because of him, I have hope. I have hope for myself, and I have hope for my son. I used to think he was so wrong and so out there, but, but seeing how God is able to change his life, I know he's able to work a miracle in my life, and I know he's able to work a miracle in my son's. I... I believe that it is possible because of Enoch, I have hope. And I I heard that and I was just like, wow. She didn't realize that she, I was, I could hear, but it, it just, the realization hit me that, you know, for those who are listening, you are the closest thing that many people have to Christ. And you are his ambassadors. You're his representatives. So you are, to, to many people, you represent Christ to the world. And we need to recognize that our life is a testimony. And everything we do has an influence for good or for evil. And life is so much more enjoyable when we use this influence to influence people for good. There was another elder that um, he used to drive us to church. He saw me uh, when I was at my worst, and I, I was a very rebellious younger younger child. I would stay up all night playing video games, and my mom would drag me to church, and I didn't want to be there. And I I just sleep in the pews, and um, or I'd just be walking around the neighborhood during the sermon, and and it was just um, I didn't want to be there. And uh, this 
this elder, he would give me, give us a ride to church, and he'd see me, like, disrespecting my mom, just being rowdy and being rebellious, and he, one day, I was outside the porch, I was, I was um, on the computer, and he pulled up in the driveway, and he's like, yeah, hey, excuse me, I'm looking for an Enoch Leffingwell, have you seen him? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. And he's like, oh, hey, it, it's, it's me, it's Blondie, and and I walked up to the car, and I was like, hey, Blondie, how's it going? Long time no see. And he, he knew me back when I used to be fat. I was 210 pounds. I was um, borderline diabetic, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Um, I, I mean, that's a whole other story. I was the second fattest kid in an elementary school of about 1,000 students. I had some serious health challenges. So I look totally different now. Now I'm taller and thinner, and um, he didn't recognize me. I was older. So if you want to know about that testimony, uh, you can go to a YouTube channel, Walk God Ministries, and um, there is a video that's called um, Heart Attack at Age 12, Amazing Testimony. So, um, but he, he sees me and he's like, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on a sermon. I'm going to be preaching tomorrow. And instantly he just broke out. He's like, praise you, Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, praise God. I'll never say, I'll never say God's grace can't touch another soul again. And I heard him, I'm like, what? This guy said that God's, like, he he was saying, like, oh, God's grace is good, but I don't know if it could touch that child of the devil. That kid is so far gone that I don't know if it could really reach him. And uh, then he saw that I was not only giving my heart to Christ, but I'm working on a sermon. I'm preaching the gospel. He was so grateful. He's like, I'm going to be there. It's like, tell me when and where. I'm, I'm there. And he showed up. And he really enjoyed it. And um, it was just an amazing experience. When I gave my heart to Christ, I, I wanted to tell everybody. I made a list of everyone who I knew. And I just shared with them about this newfound joy, this newfound Savior. I... Um, <laughs> My mom knows some uh, private investigating skills, and, and so she has access to, like, databases that a lot of people don't really know of. And um, with some of her training, I found out how to get an email list of all of the teachers in my entire school district. Of, I mean, there's so many uh, public schools. And I found the email address of every single teacher that I had from... Um, like third grade onward to um, like junior year in high school. And um, that was a lot of teachers. And I all invited them to come listen to me preach at church. I told them, hey, uh, this is Enoch Leffingwell. I was your student. And I um, have recently given my heart to Christ. My life has changed. And I want to tell people about it. I have the opportunity to speak at my church it's my first time or it's my second time speaking and I want to invite you to attend. Would you be interested in coming? And I blasted it out to all my teachers and um, and I was surprised. There, there's quite a few of them that were able to come out and to, to listen and hear and uh, it was just such a shock because they all knew I was a troubled child and to see this difference they um, they came out and they wanted to see. And I'm, I've just been so blessed and privileged over the years of serving Christ. I mean, a, a life of Christ, it, it's not about us or sacrifice or, or things like this. There's a joy and there's meaning and there's purpose. And seeing, uh, knowing the great darkness that I have come from, it just, I live to be able to help others, to share with others what God has shared with me. I was walking to school one day, I was 16, and I'm just like trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life? Like what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And I was just confused. And I, as I was, I was putting myself in the position of different things that I wanted to be, and I thought, well, maybe I want to be a math teacher. I like math. I'm like, no, nah, I can't imagine going to college for all those years to be to be a teacher, I was like, well, I always want to play and um, be a video game designer. I'm like, nah, I don't want to deal with video games anymore. I'm like, well, maybe I thought about a stand-up comedian. No, I don't want to do that. 
I'm just like going down the list. I'm like realizing, wow, I would be miserable doing anything other than sharing with others what God has shared with me. I'm like, I want to work for the Lord. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And that was the day I found my purpose. That was the day that I found the reason why I was born. And ever since then, I, I have dedicated all my efforts that I possibly can to share with others what God has shared with me. And I have, um, I have been uh, having the opportunity to, um, to be in full-time ministry for the last years. And I have some incredible people. And the friends that I uh, stopped hanging out with in high school, God has surrounded me with some of the most amazing and encouraging friends. I love the people that I get to meet. And most of the friends that I have now, I met in ministry. When you are working to a common goal and a purpose and you have a mission, it's like there's something very special. If you've never been in, involved with a team that is moving forward, that has a clear direction of where they're going in the future and how to get there, and everybody's using their unique special talents to do something greater than themselves, to make the world a better place, to share the gospel with those around you, then it's like... I mean, it's a very special thing, um, and that's what I've been able to have the privilege to experience day in and day out with friends that I, I realize my family in Christ, I am a lot closer to than even many of my blood relatives, like my brothers and sisters in Jesus, I have, uh, I have a lot more in common with than some of my own blood relatives. And it's truly like the promise said, that Jesus said there's no man that has forsaken mother, father, brother, sister, friend, family, house, land for my sake and the gospel, but he shall receive 100 fold in this life and the life to come of friends, family, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers um, in, in Christ. And that's so true. Like I, I realize I can go anywhere in the world and I've got family. I can go anywhere in the world and I know that there are pe believers that I have in common with. There's there's people ready to open their home and just em embrace me and realize that we already know quite a bit about each other because of this common ground of Christ where some people, like I, I look at a church, I'm like this is a miracle that people are able to come together from all these different backgrounds, you have people that used to be midnight burglars, you have video games, you have like cheerleaders and and football jockeys, you've got rocket scientists, doctors, and, and all sorts of different people, but they're all coming together in one location for one purpose, and they're getting along, and they're enjoying each other's company, I'm just like, hmm, try to throw a party in the world with that type of audience and see how how they how well they hit it off is not going to happen but it is a miracle from God when we're able to come together and fellowship and encourage each other and the, that we have have so much in common in Jesus I'm I realize that living a life with Christ is not a life of sacrifice uh, uh, well there's sacrifices but really everything that we lose it's like I've counted as dung for the excellency of Christ because we can gain so much more meaning um, with Jesus. And I, I just, I want to encourage everybody that there's something my mom would always say, don't give up five minutes before the miracle. Sometimes your Christian experience will be challenging. You'll have some ebbs, you'll have some flows, you'll have, it'll, you'll have ups and downs. But just know, where else would you go? Like, really think about it. What better option is there? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Like, this is, you, you can have eternal life today. You want to know how to make e eternity longer? John 17:3 says this is eternal life 
that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The only way to make eternity life longer is to start now. You can start by knowing Jesus and the only true God whom he has sent. You can start by serving him today and experience a life of meaning and joy. And uh, I'll tell you, friends, will it be easy? I can't promise you that. But will it be worth it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It will definitely be worth it. Be, this has been giving my heart to Christ and choosing to be a Christian has been the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. But it's the best decision I've ever made in my life. And I continually have to choose that life every day, each moment when I wake up, consecrating myself to God, saying, Lord, take me as wholly thine. Use me today in your service. Abide with me. Let all my will be wrought in thee. And I lay all my plans at your feet to be given up or carried out as your providence shall indicate. I want to serve you in every morning consecrating yourself to Christ. It's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily surrendering of the heart, of the mind, of the natural inclination. And, and when you focus on the glories of heaven and you focus on his love and what he has to share for us, what he has to offer and how what we can do when we co-labor with God, then all the sacrifices, the cross that we are to bear, yes, there's a cross for the Christian. Yes, there are sacrifices, but we don't, we don't, um, it, it's small compared to what we get to experience with Jesus. And I'm so thankful that, um, that you each have um, taken the time to be able to hear this testimony, because truly, God is, God just as he is able to change my life, he's able to change your life. He's able to change your children's life. And the people who you think are so gone outside of Christ, who may never come to him or not showing any interest, and they're just rebellious, those are the people who Christ died for. And he, just like the parable of the one lost sheep, the smallest number that could be numbered, so Christ would have died for that one soul if they were the only soul that needed a Savior. There is... Hope for the hopeless. I know this from experience. So don't ever give up hope on yourself. Don't ever give up hope on others. Because God is working. And he wants to work through you. And to share with others what God has shared with you. You have talents. You have gifts. That when you use them for the Lord. Like all these things that I did outside of Christ. God was able to redeem these skills. Redeem these talents. And now I'm able to use them. For evangelism and teach, tutoring people for math, now I'm able to teach people about the gospel. I sold candy when I was young. Now I can sell the truth and and um, and the uh, just some of the the different the computer skills. When I was on the computer a lot, now I'm able to do online Bible studies with you. I'm here um, and just different things that I had like different skills I developed in Satan's um, army or in his in this warfare on the wrong side when I gave my heart to Christ then God's able to strengthen and noble noble and sanctify those skills and to be able to use them for the Lord's service and I was really grateful for that and God can use your skills too the harvest truly is plenteous the labors are few there's so much work to be done and so few helpers. There is a great need for people to raise their hand and say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. Just show me. And I am willing. And there just comes a point where we just have to say, Lord, I have nothing to offer except for my heart. And I can give this to you, however dirty, however unclean and deceitful it is. I give you my heart because by faith I know you're asking for it and I trust that you're going to clean it, you're going to sanctify it, you're going to wash it and you're going to return it to me uh, stronger than when I gave it to you. And that's his promise. He's going to take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And if it's your desire to allow God to work in your life, to be willing, to be made willing, then I invite you to pray with me. And accept Jesus as your Savior and 
or to recommit your life to Christ because there's a life worth living and that life is found in the life of Christ. So if this is your desire, I invite you to pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your ability to change lives. And Father, we, we pray that you will, will be with those who are under the sound of my voice, that you will help them. Some people um, have never given their hearts to you, and they're living a life, and, and they're not satisfied. They were truly finding that this life is like, it's like walking and moving while there's still death, and pain and misery, and, um, and they're looking for a better way. They want to choose you. And Father, we, we pray, um, we want to accept Christ into our life to, um, to change us and to use us for your courts. I pray that you will please um, fill us with your Holy Spirit and be with those who have already given their heart to Christ but want to recommit themselves. Maybe we have fallen slack on our commitments to you or maybe we have um, gone astray or gone a different way, but Lord, I pray that you'll bring us back to the path of life, the path that is worth living. And in times when we are discouraged, let us remember that you're the only ones with the words of eternal life. Where else would we go? And I pray that you encourage us that we can follow in your footsteps. Thank you so much for your love and your grace. We pray uh, for a greater revelation of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Enoch. I have to say, like, you're right even here. Such a good message, brother. Preach it. Yeah, it's, um, I'm sure that you have been, uh, you know, for young people. When they hear, I mean, not only young people, but since you are young yourself, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure that you have been a very big blessing to young people who are maybe playing video games and, you know, doing all the things you were doing. Yeah, the Lord has definitely put a burden on my heart to reach some other younger people because, I mean, to some, they may think like, oh, give me your to Christ 16, I wish I did that. But for me, I'm just like, man, nine years of my life just totally wasted. I wish I gave my heart to Christ sooner. And I have a burden for the young people that God will raise up an army of workers as our youth to help consecrate their talents to the Lord's service because there's a mighty work to do and young people can do a work when they give their hearts to Jesus the sooner the better there's no time for playing around and wasting on just things that will never satisfy and I can remember from when I was you know uh, yeah 15 16 and you know up to I became a Christian you know I I tried to find interest but you know nothing was really worth having my attention but when I started to you know change my lifestyle and come Christ the you know new doors were opening and it was just I just I'm so happy for that time so praise the Lord for uh, guiding us his way amen so, uh, amen I, I don't think that's you know when God wants to take things away from us or change things in our lives it's just so we benefits it's not really a sacrifice you know, it's just us keeping on to sin. Yeah, you know, whatever. It destroys us. Yeah. We're, we're just giving away things that we like for, for things that we love or things that are really just hurting us or causing us pain or misery. And God always play, gives us something better. It's something better, the watchword of a Christian. The Lord... Whenever he takes anything away, we can know that he's going to replace it with something so much more fulfilling, more rewarding, that not only benefits us, but benefits those around us. And it just, he's always seeking to make our lives even better. He loves us so much, he doesn't leave us in our sin, but he gives us something better. Amen. That's a very good verse to end this program with. So thank you much, so much, uh, Enoch. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. So uh, God bless you, everyone, and um, see you next time.